Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 208 and coming to you from Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters. Today, I am joined by writer-producer Brian Robinson. Third time's a charm. Let's see if we can do this. Writer Garrick Zykin. Thank you for having me. And our road test producer, Ben Davis. Let's do it. Yeah, we had a couple of false starts, but we're on now, and we're going to keep going. We've got three vehicles to talk about. Our lightning round, a viewer question. We'll see if anybody's got any rant and raves. But let's start with you, Ben. You just came back from driving the 2020 Hyundai Palisade three-row SUV slash crossover a kin, I gather, to the Kia Telluride, but why don't you tell us what's the same and what's different? Sure, absolutely. Uh, definitely akin to the Kia Telluride. The Telluride is uh, built in the U.S., where the Palisade is built in Korea, actually. But they do share a lot of the same stuff um, while having obvious differences. I mean, the exterior styling and sheet metal couldn't get further apart from one another. Um, the uh, drivetrain is the same, the engine's the same, transmission the same. Both are available in front-wheel drive and their H-Track all-wheel drive. Um, and then once you get in the inside, it's even more dramatic. Uh, the, um, the Palisade uses um, a more integrated uh, dash layout, much mm-hmm. like you see in, uh, in uh, Mercedes-Benz. Right. Whereas the Telluride just has your traditional let's three, stab three sections a sideways tablet in the dash yeah. kind of yeah exactly with a with a true center stack right. and all that stuff. Um, uh, Palisade uses a lot more uh, finer materials inside, like a lot of quilting so through the doors. So you thought it was, and was more substantially more upscale. Looking. It's it's definitely geared to be the more luxurious mm. of the two for sure. Uh, it has um, a push button transmission. Uh, you have a power third row, which you don't have, you can't get in the Telluride. Um, it does move a little slow, the power feature, um, and I didn't think there was any problem with the manual Telluride third row, honestly. But, I mean, it's huge inside. It's super comfortable in the second row that slides back and forth. The third row can fit a full-size adult, although much like third row seats, it is kind of like a lightly padded park bench kind of ride back there. But um, Any uh, difference that you recall in what it's like to the drive in other words is the hyundai a little bit softer or i i would say not having driven them back to back in the same day which you would have to do because the differences if any would be very Very minute yeah um i can tell you that the palisade uh with its thin um a pillars up front and uh the mirror mounted on the door it does drive a lot smaller than it looks Hmm. um it's a big vehicle. It is big for sure. I mean, yeah, it drives yeah. it drives light on its feet and um, with a ton of visibility. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, it looks big, but it's actually smaller than a Honda Pilot. And so that was her, not, that was actually going to be my next question: is how do you think? You know, soon we'll be looking at how these all stack up against Pilot and the Highlander, and this is really serious competition in a way for those. And I'm wondering how. It, it, so it's not as big as a Pilot, uh, not quite as long. Correct. All right. Yeah. And, you know, it, it makes for buyers, uh, it's going to be a, put a lot of pressure on price, I think. Oh, yeah. You get a lot for your money. And they're stacking it up against a new Explorer, too. And, mm-hmm. of course, there's Atlas in yeah, this category. It would be interesting because it starts yeah low low 30s and then for the base. And then the mid-level trim is only two grand more. But then it's like a 10 grand, yeah, it's step, a 10 grand step up to the limited, which... Which is 46. But yeah. and you can't get a lot of... The stuff that's on the limited uh, down below. So it's it's it it's is a, little a big, tricky there. It, yeah. It's a big price jump. Yeah, I agree it with seems you on odd. That. Uh, it's going to make the three row uh, large. I guess is the correct term these days. Uh, it's just short of full size, but the large uh, crossover market very very mo- more even more competitive than yeah. it's been before. I mean, and it'll continue to be the, have a warranty that you can't beat. Yeah, hmm. it's got a lot of things going for it for sure. Okay, let's uh, switch switch gears a little bit and head over to Garrick, who's uh, just back from driving uh, the 2020 Chevrolet Silverado 1500 with the three-liter Duramax diesel, the yes. first diesel in their light duty for in a long time. Mm-hmm. I think they did once once upon a time many years ago. But go ahead. What would you think? So this is their first inline-six turbo mm-hmm. diesel, and I haven't done the research, but I'm sure they had a diesel. So, I'm not sure of that, point, but it doesn't matter. Right. Oh. It's ancient history. So it's a, a three-liter Duramax. 
Duramax turbo diesel, 277 horsepower, 460 pound-feet of torque, which uh, they say 95% of that peak torque comes on at 1,250 RPM, uh, Mm 10-speed automatic. We were in Oregon. I I really like this truck. I don't have a need for a truck on my in my daily life, but if I did, this is the kind of truck I want. I like the engine. It was just very smooth and strong and confident is not really the best word, but it was just very capable and it, and um, there was a lot of strength and I, uh, assurance. That's not a good word either, but I, I really enjoyed driving this. Um, it was a lot quieter than I was expecting. It's been a while since, s- since I've driven that. a inside diesel. Inside and outside? Inside, uh, inside and outside. Uh, inside, if you didn't know it was a diesel, I, I don't think that that you would you would know driving wow. it inside. It really was um, that that quiet and that comfortable. And even and I um, got some engine shots um, and had had the engine running obviously. And it's a lot quieter than than than, than you would expect. Um, but it still has has a really nice sound to you it. I think you could. Uh, I see people with diesel trucks turning them off in the drive through to order food. <laughs> you think you could? No, you wouldn't have to do that. Order? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah you, you absolutely could do this. Uh, I can see the uh, Chevrolet commercial now. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, they're talking more like about you know pay, payload and towing capacity. Payload is eighteen seventy and a ninety three hundred uh, towing capacity. There's a lot of chatter on the internet about uh, it getting the um, fuel economy crown mm-hmm. for full size uh, pickup right. trucks. I guess they did. They make any claims? Not, not that I recall. But during the event, they had us do a loop to see who could get the highest mileage, and people I hate those. and people yeah. were getting in the 40s. Um, so one, the winner claimed to have had 46, Jeez. but, but again, wow. it's not very scientific and, you know, it was kind of an honor system and, yeah. and, and <laughs> well, an honor I, system I, I'm among ju- journalists. I'm that's just a, being, a <laughs> being a bit skeptical and just laying it out for you. And, but that was, you know, also turning off the air conditioning and there are things that you can do to, uh, to, to get that high. But most of the people were coming in at, at over 40 miles per gallon. In in this day and age, with Crazy. gasoline prices relatively low, do you think there is a market for light duty diesel? I mean, I obviously, I guess Rams already proven that there is. Uh, any comments? Do you think it's too little, too late? I think there's definitely a market for it. People just love diesels, mm-hmm. especially if you're towing. Uh, you know, we'll hear things. Well, it doesn't tow any more than whatever, but it's not. It's not how much it tows; it's the way it tows it. I mean, if you towed with a diesel, you know, you instantly feel a difference. So, yeah. uh, and people, some people just love the sound of the diesels and right. love the longevity of them as well. And I, I just like the way that that it drove, the way it felt. The way that, that engine was it was really nice. It really was. You know, I was just looking up on the uh, internet while we were up there. It looks like until 1999, you could actually get a, a turbo diesel V8 in a okay. 1500 uh, Chevy pickup. Okay. Which, uh, I thought that was just in the, uh, in the HD, but no. Come to think of it, we had a we had a suburban. We had a suburban. Had a suburban. Okay. So th- thus, their distinction: inline yeah. six turbo. It's their Versus first one. Yeah. <laughs> and that previous engine is probably not one like people like to think about too much, since it was so trouble prone. Anyway, um, let's move on to Garrett. We're going to stay with you. Uh, the 2020 Mercedes-Benz GLS. Give us an idea of where the GLS falls in their hierarchy of SUVs. Well, it's it's their their, their largest SUV. Um, it's their S class SUV. It is their S class right. SUV. Yes. Yeah. So they have uh, two engines. They have the uh, um, inline six with the their EQ Boost. And then the 550 becomes the 580, so the horsepower um, increases by 34 to 483. But this is the first time they're bringing that EQ Boost technology to a V8. Can you explain it a little bit? It has to do with a 48 volt electrical system. Sure. It's, so it's a mild hybrid. It is a mild hybrid. So it's a 48 volt electrical system, and you have an integrated starter generator. So basically, when you're, um, it, it does operate like a mild hybrid. So when you're starting off, you're you have that electric boost, but also at speed, you're not waiting for the turbo. That that electric mm-hmm. um, engine kind of kicks in. And they have um, a feature on this, what they call sailing, which as you're cruising along, you'll actually uh, just be in the electric engine, not not on the gas. So it's kind of a 
a big update and a big improvement over mm-hmm. the mild hybrid systems that GM was peddling for years mm-hmm. and, and got very few takers, but they're not giving you a choice here of making an option. It's just part of the powertrain. Right. And this isn't their first vehicle. The GLE no. had it. CLS yeah. um, has it as well. So we've driven it quite a few times. It well, works. It works really well. I like, I like it. And um, I don't notice any turbo lag at speed. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it really kicks in uh, very nicely. I assume it's very luxurious, very tech laden. Brian, you were going uh, to jump just, in. We had a, just had an X7 in. How would you compare it to uh, the X7? Do, do, do. Well, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to drive the X7, uh, uh, so you were that, traveling too much. I, I was. I was traveling and, and driving these, um, so I, I, I don't know. But it, it does have a lot of technology. It has the uh, MBUX Mercedes Benz user experience, but it's upgraded. Mm-hmm. Um, this one is the, the new GLS has um, is a little more off road capable, and that was part of our um, our drive event. Um, one of the things that they did with the all-wheel drive system, their formatic system. Before it was a 50-50 split. Now it's a variable. So as much as 100% can go to the rear. Party time. So that helps with, with, with off-roading. Um, how pricey? How pricey, yes. Starts at 75 too. So it's about the same as a, right. as a, a X7. Yep. Yeah, very similar pricing. Okay, from luxury SUVs, we're going to zip on over to our lightning round where each of us has, let's say, 30 seconds or so to talk about a trending automotive topic, although who's counting? (laughs) The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety looked at how drivers perceive semi-autonomous driving systems and found that the names of these systems can mislead people into thinking they are more capable than they are. Uh, should car makers be forced to change names like Autopilot, Super Cruise, and Pro Pilot Assist, or should they just do a better job of explaining these system capabilities to the customers? I should point out that 60% of the people they surveyed thought that Tesla's Autopilot meant that you could take your hands off the road and mm-hmm. let the car drive itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was substantially less for the other people. What do you think? Uh, everybody's just boiling over with opinions. <laughs> I know you have a strong opinion on this, J.D. Well, Why don't you, you know, start off? I just off? think it's, it's training. Nobody reads the owner's manuals. Mm-hmm. Uh, the service people are not giving uh, people proper education. I think the manufacturers bear some responsibility. I think there's enough blame to put all, all the way around. Well, they're going to market their product to get people to buy it. I mean, it's no different than anyone else, you know, naming their product the best something or other. It's probably not the best, but that's what they named it, so... They want to call it autopilot. They want to, you know, give the impression that uh, the car drives itself. You know, why not if it sells more vehicles? It's it, it's a real liability issue, I think, for the car makers. A lot of fine print there, I'm sure, in the owner's manual. Well, we know <laughs> if you even get an owner's manual, it's probably all on the tablet, started. right? Yeah. We uh, we know from getting vehicles in here to test. Sometimes there's an owner's manual in them, and sometimes there isn't. Right. And trying to decipher, even when there is an owner's manual, you have to go through so many pages of legalese till you get to the function. Yeah, most of them just have like a really condensed owner's manual. Now you have to yeah. go online to read the full manual. I, I think it's an educational process. Um, I do think that some names like autopilot probably uh, ought to be uh, modified, but I don't want to see any kind of legislation or something like that. That just seems to muddy up the water. By the time you did that, they will be on and change the name and go to something else. Mm-hmm. So, people, if you're buying a vehicle, in my <coughs> opinion, and it's just mine, if you're buying a vehicle with some kind of semi autonomous system, and by the way, that's the only thing you can buy right now, there is no such thing as a fully autonomous car that's available for retail purchase um read the owner's manual figure it out before you have a chance to try it and have your hands ready to grab the wheel yeah. anytime right. the um and don't take a nap because three to six percent of the people in that study thought they could take a nap yeah. when it was on amazing now from our own experience here has anybody driven any of these systems that they trust i have the, i have uh, too yeah, when the X uh, when the new XC90 came out in Volvo, I thought Volvo's was pretty much ahead of the curve. I, I mean, I would trust it for a, a couple of miles mm-hmm. of um, you know non highway roads that had some bends and twists in them. It's cool to show friends how it works, and that's unusual mm-hmm. that it would work that well on a non four lane highway. Yeah, yeah, it was two lanes running each way, or uh, one one each way, um, with some pretty heavy heavy curves. Um, and like I said, for a couple of miles, it was right on the game. 
I thought Super Cruise was was while it's limited to interstate highways, although there is a new version of it that's better. I thought that it was more relaxing, uh, and you could take your hands off the wheel, but you know it doesn't. It it is limited. It's it it is exactly what it says: a Super Cruise Control. I like the Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Uh, system and we've had a couple of them and the last time we had the e-class in um, I went for a drive to the beach which is about two and a half hours Mm -hmm. from here and uh, with the adaptive cruise control and the whole system set up I drove most of the way now you have to put your hands on the wheel every I I was keeping 30 to 40 seconds Mm -hmm. but other than that um, it worked really well and there's a level of confidence in that system that I um I, and it might be just from using it, but I, I think it I, is. But, but, but experience. I, yeah, it is experience, and you're using um, it the right way, right? And when I use these, I try to do it where there's not a lot of cars around. If there, if there's cars coming by, I'm I'm going to put hands on the wheels because I don't I have trust issues even with technology. Sure. Um, but what I do like about that feature is the you can change lanes by just turning mm-hmm. the, the turn signal. Mm-hmm. And I took some friends out for a drive like that, and they were a little freaked out yeah. by that. It is the, the first, first time, the I ever first did time it too, you the know. Class, yeah. Um, so, so I do, I do like their, their system and the more I've driven it, I, th- I think that it inspires confidence quickly once you, once you get to use it, but no, take, don't take a nap. Brian, you've had a lot of experience I, had, with the system. Yeah, I've played with all of them. I don't really feel com- uh, comfortable with any of them, really. Yes, they will drive the car, but they're bad drivers. You ping pong back and forth between the lines. <laughs> I, I, I hate, you, I, I hate uh, the you know, you get into corners too far. You know, I would have already started turning. So, I mean, sure, if you want someone to drive poorly for you, let the car do it. <laughs> I, but, I, that's why I was impressed with the Volvo system. It seemed to do that a lot less, if if at all. Yeah. All of these systems are considered uh, number two second on the scale, number two autonomous systems with full autonomy being four. So we're not quite there yet by, I think, a long shot. But So if you do end up with a vehicle that's got one of these systems, and I remember on the X7, it was actually fairly disguised. Uh, um, learn how to use it before you have to actually go out and use it in the mm-hmm. highway. Good advice. Okay, our viewer question um, from a number of folks. On a recent episode, we did an EV roundup where we tested the Hyundai Ioniq, the VW e-Golf, the Chevrolet Bolt, the Nissan Leaf, and the Nero EV. Many viewers were upset that the Tesla Model 3 was not included in the test, despite being the most talked about all-electric vehicle on the market. So why was Tesla absent from the segment? It's a very good question. Our test was not inclusive, I should point out. Uh, Just five of the latest models, but why no Model 3? Well, simply put... Tesla will not send us test cars like other manufacturers. Uh, So we didn't have a vehicle here when the other vehicles were in our possession and we couldn't shoot it alongside it. I should point out we're not alone. Uh, there's not, it's not like they're discriminating against us, uh, just us. Their approach to the automotive media is very different. They don't put cars in press pools around the country for testing like other brands do. Now, when we do test a Tesla... We usually have to resort to an owner or occasionally a cooperating dealer. Uh, we have tested every model, and we thank those owners and the, uh, the the local dealer who helped us out. I should point out that we've given pretty much rave reviews to every Tesla we've tested. Uh, it didn't always be the that wasn't always the case back when they were just making the Roadster. We did two Roadster tests. Our last one was in 2011, and they did provide us with a car, but when the Model S came along, that stopped. They changed their attitude about the media. If you're on the West Coast, it's a little easier, I understand. Uh, The Model 3 that we did test came from a local owner, so we have not let their lack of cooperation with us stop us by any means, and we look forward in the future testing all of their models. I will say we gave them a Driver's Choice Award at one point for the Model S. Um, There are a couple other reasons, though, why we didn't include it. Um, We weren't sure that if we used existing footage and included it just for including it, that it would have actually fared very well. It was the only one of the models uh, in that little roundup that uh, wasn't a hatchback. It's a sedan, and it also was by far the most expensive as far as the base price. So we're not really sure it would have stacked up very well, but if we could have gotten one, we would have included it in the test. And I hope that answers uh, all of the folks out there that wonder we weren't trying to eliminate it. We just couldn't get one. Anyone have anything else you want to add on that? 
Uh, couldn't think of possibly anything to add to that. Okay. That was pretty uh, thorough. How about rant and raves? Anything um, that is on anybody's mind? I have a follow-up for my rant. The last one, I was Ooh, ranting excellent. about the scan, the lack of scan buttons. I found one oh. on our Honda <laughs> Insight. It's right there. Um, I used it, and what I liked about it is that when you're using it, there's a button that it's red for when you want to stop, and it's within your peripheral vision, so you don't have to take your eyes off the road. So thank does you, it, thank you, Honda, for that. Does it shut the front speakers off as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was that would a be driver preference. <laughs> there's a recent uh, survey uh, that came out that was talking about the propensity for accidents, and if you go out into the hinterlands in smaller cities, you know, they do very well. And it's not no big surprise that cities in the Northeast, including our home Baltimore, Washington area, don't do very well. Uh, but I do wonder, what do you think is the biggest, biggest single cause uh, in your just driving experience, not scientific? When you're out on the road and somebody goes by you, what is it that you think they are more accident prone? Is there any telltale signs that you think, I want to stay away from this person? They're on the phone. Tailgating excessively, like literally inches off people's bumper. Yeah, yeah just aggressive lane changing, no turn signals is mainly it for me. Aggressive. It, you just got to get is it, is a it car just length impatience? ahead just to do it. They just, uh, I just don't think people have the respect for what can go wrong and how easily and quickly, quickly. it can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They just, they've been driving that way for 10 years and never had a problem. Yeah. And so they just keep doing it. And I think as cars get bigger, too, the bigger your vehicle you're driving – the more confident you feel about the way you drive. Absolutely. And the less concerned you are that you might make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Just remember, it's 70 miles an hour. It's a blink of an eye, and you could be uh, in big trouble. Oh, it's usually those people, though, that don't have any devices in their hands or anything like that. I mean, they're driving erratically and fast, but they're focused. You know what I mean? So it's, which are you more scared of, that guy (laughs) or the guy that's on the highway doing 70, making tech, doing a text message? I think the latter. Yeah. The, the two of them combined is going to turn back scary. fast. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, everybody. Brian, Garrick, Ben, it's been a great podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Motor Week podcast number 208. And by the way, if you have a chance to watch Motor Week, we would appreciate it on public television stations everywhere. Or, and we're also on the Motor Trend channel on your local cable system. Uh, For all of us, Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer, podcast producer Greg Carlos, and podcast creator Bob Mixter. Thanks very much for being a part of Motor Week. I'm John Davis. We hope to see you around here at Motor Week very soon. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.